there's something within an environment that this post-colonial world has built that is literally no enough air, no enough water, no enough food. Countries in the global north have had the privilege and the luxury of polluting and reaching the standard of living that they needed to get to. And now they want to tell us that we can't aspire to that. Europe has been built out of the wealth of the global south. It's a system that needs to be replaced and a sick system cannot be fixed. It's about just replenishing, letting the earth recover. My work is about creating models like sustainable models indigenous-inspired sustainable models from where many other rural areas can get inspiration from. One tree, they will give hundreds of thousands of fruits and who knows how many, you know, cosmetics and products to so many people for so many years. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the things they used to say is that Earth is definitely enough for humans' need, but not for humans' greed. From someone who used to live in Milan mm. and then moved to Ghana in a self-built eco-village, mm -hmm. what's that journey been like? It's been a, yeah, it's been a journey. It's been a long journey, a journey of a lot of ups, a journey of a lot of downs, a journey of a lot of trials, a journey of a lot of mistakes, and a journey of a lot of learning. And um, yeah, so basically I'm from Ghana. My father's from Ghana and from Italy as well. My mother's from Italy. My father's from a very beautiful place up on the mountains. We call it mountains. In Ghana, there are more hills, but we call them mountains, the Aquape Mountains. Very beautiful, very fresh, and that's where my family is from. And uh, my mother is from uh, a very beautiful place in Italy called Napoli, mm. that basically holds the cultural heritage of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of Italy, especially a lot of stereotype that goes around Italy. Generally, is Napoli, you know, the pizza, the food, the welcoming as well. But I was not brought up there. I was brought up in the north of uh, of Italy, in Milan, Milan as much more of a Nordic influence, is much more of a, let's say, Germanic-like influence. And uh, not only the weather in Milan is colder, but also the environment, the people are relatively colder. You know? so, why do you say that? Why I say that? Yeah. It's just uh, culturally speaking. Like there's, a, there's a, a, a say in Milan that says, for example, talking about you hosting me, like right now I'm relatively used to, to people hosting me this way because I've been outside of the Western context. But... In reality, when I first, for example, when I first came to India, eventually we will talk about it, I got hosted in the same very way, very openly from relatively a stranger. We met before, but not for such an extensive period of time, right? Yeah. Yet you welcome me so beautifully, so openly. And uh, in Europe, generally speaking, it's not like that. Where my mother is from is a bit different, but in the northern part of Milan, uh, sorry, the northern part of Italy, that Nordic part of Europe as well is not like that. And in Milan, we have a say, they ever say, I don't claim they say, but it goes like, Los pite puzza dopo tre giorni, which literally means, which literally means the guests start to smell bad after three days. Really? That's, that's, that's how it is, you know. It's a, it's a kind of joking thing that people are saying, but it really defines the, the type of culture that. Have you heard of the um, Hindi version of it? We have a saying here, which is Atiti Devo Bhavo, which right. means the, the guest is God. Oh, okay, so this is the opposite version yeah. of it, yes. So, yes, I heard of that. I never. I never heard it in Hindi per se, but I heard many times, actually the first time that I was welcomed by a complete stranger that eventually became really a brother from another mother. His name is Rahul. And he literally, when he saw me, invited me to his house. It's a whole story that eventually I'll tell. But then he goes like, you are God here. So you are our God. So please come, stay here. And this is, was one of the first uh, beautiful introduction that I had of a, such a deep and beautiful place that, uh, that is India, you know? That of course, there's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of things also maybe politically can be discussed, but in the end of the day, as a, as a cultural heritage that is so huge and so big, that really touched my heart to the point that it became almost like a second home. You know? But uh, going back to Italy way before I came here, I was um, playing a lot of basketball. I was into sports a lot. Explains the height. I mean, I'm not that tall for a basketball player, actually. I would be a, a point guard. And then, uh, so a lot of basketball, actually. my I couldn't see myself doing anything else in life growing up rather than being a basketball player. Next to basketball player, I always, I always had in my heart, I don't know why, maybe because of the inner nature of each human being to somehow get lost in a natural environment and just live peacefully and um, 
and one with, with nature, even though I didn't know much about it. Growing up in Milan, once again, you don't see a lot of nature. And by the way, I was not even from Milan, Milan. I was from the outskirts of Milan, which generally is a bit more, let's say monotonous an environment. is an environment that is much more, let's say you see the same people every day, same yeah. places every day, and you know everybody around. It can be cozy, but also if you want to open up your mind within mm. a world or within, I don't know, within possibilities, within New ideas, abilities. new conversations. Exactly. It's like the new. The new was something that was missing. I was very, at some point, hungry for the new, thirsty to get to know more, to learn more, and learn more about the world, learn more about myself too. How do you become hungry for something you don't know about? Just like if I would start to keep it, if, if I would just all of a sudden keep this very dog inside the water. You would just start. But that's what I mean. The dog oxygen. would believe that that little small pool is mm. his entire life. How that, does the dog begin to dream? That's, that's the beautiful part is that if I would take the dog not on the pool, but inside the water, it would be in need of something. What it would be in need of? In, the head is inside the water. What if, after maybe a minute, what it would be in need of? Air. Air. So I s- clearly see that certain environments don't give us what we need, humanly speaking. There are certain elements that literally also physically speaking not enough air not enough water not enough food no no there's something within an environment that this post-colonial world has built that is really literally not for our nature and i believe that's how something got started to be activated within myself but also once again i was not approaching it approaching it so much consciously it was mainly maybe a faraway dream in the meantime i was still playing basketball doing my thing and then uh, i remember in the evening i was uh watching a lot of documentaries about indigenous people living around the world and how they would be actually be able to not only survive, but to thrive mm. and to take care of themselves or their own needs or whatever they wanted just by relying completely on this relationship with the land. And to me, it was so fascinating, especially coming from a world that is so monetary based, so transactional, so, um, so able to keep on going only if a sense of uh, production and consumption and extraction and and also division, individualism takes place. So in a place like there, I didn't, there was no sense of community. The only community could be your, your family maybe. Mm. But even that doesn't go too far. Like here, you guys have much more of a concept of extended family. And um, in the context, it's not. Once again, my roots, Naples, Ghana, they have all of this yeah. um, extended family type of thing. But I was growing up in an environment with friends and and uh, and people around that was having this type of the same mentality, and also I must mention that um, Italy is an environment that it is it it is a system, it is a country that has been built within a an European Eurocentric mindset that therefore inevitably approaches a lot of um, racist concept. All 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 the identity of Italy per se. It is a very beautiful, amazing culture, don't get me wrong. I'm very also somehow proud to be Italian, just as being Ghanaian, but I never felt home in Italy. I could never feel home in Italy. Did you face racism in Italy? Of course, racism is a is a, is a a big thing. And the point is that people are not even aware of that. It's so embedded within the system that people don't even realize unless they're on the other side. What yeah. did racism manifest as in Italy for you? Um, it is, I was saying that, so it is so Im- embedded within that culture, within the way of being, within the the way of, um, it can be anything, it can be a TV news where you might hear certain comments and certain words used in order to define people of color. They are like, they are also people, you know, or it might be just a, 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 a joke. I don't know. Yeah, I remember like reading on a newspaper, a, f- a black, a black found dead. Like literally, there was like un nero trovato morto. Like literally, a black found there. Like, 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 <laughs> like an object. Like, like yeah, dehumanizing. You know? Yeah, but um, and once again, this is not something that is done. I mean, arguably intentional, but it is something that is uh, is just as um, it is also the whole education system within the whole this within the whole Europe. So yeah, Italy felt a lot of racism, and um, so I never felt home. I never felt home. It could have been. Yes, a TV news, it could have been a comment, it could have been a joke. It could have been even me walking on the street and somebody, maybe a young yard, be like, hey, you go back to Africa. You know, just like that, you know? And in, I mean, as a teenager, you're like, you know, what is this? Yeah. And this doesn't mean that, you know, there's an issue, especially that a lot of people think that racism are mainly this type of example that I did, like this 
last mm. comment that this junkyard might have done. But the bigger, the biggest and more, let's say, vicious racism is the one that is not that loud. It's the one that is in the, within a microaggression. It's the one that is within the system where you going somewhere and people will look at you like, what are you doing here? Where you looking for a job and people clearly see you as like, no, no, for you're in the wrong place altogether, you know? I have a story of my father going to the council in order to do some paperwork. He was just on the line where everybody, every other citizen should have been. And the person on the counter goes like, no, Mr. Immigration, the other side. I'm like, wow. <laughs> and my father, I mean, pr proud as he was, he was like, he made a whole scene, you know, I was like, what yeah. are you talking about? As he so, should have. So all of this is just to uh, talk about the reality of uh, what Italy has been for me growing up. And once again, it's a beautiful place in an amazing environment. In the meantime, it's a place that really reflects the reality, the European reality. There is a reality that has been literally developed out of colonization. And colonization literally worked. Colonization, could only, the mentality was this. I, I don't have enough resources. I want more resources. I need more land. So I need to go somewhere else in order to take it. What gives me the right to take this land from other people? Because indigenous people, these people are there. So what gives me the right to do so? It's a concept of superiority. So that's how white supremacy started to take place. Mm. So we cannot talk about colonialism without talking about racism. And we cannot talk about the European development without understanding and analyzing the actual atrocity that took place during the colonial time. You know, Europe has been built out of the wealth of the global south. Europe has been built completely out of colonization. All this modernity that we know nowadays is a complete consequence of colonialism. Especially the way we live nowadays, how we see things, how we produce, how we eat how we consume everything is a byproduct of colonization. Where did they gain the, the, forget about the Netherlands, we are in India. So let's talk about UK. Mm. How much, how much the Brit, how much pe uh, British people took from, from Indian people? How much? The amount of wealth that they, that they not even took, but they stole yeah. from their colonies. Not only India, Ghana, Ghana is also another place that's been heavily, heavily colonized. So we cannot talk about the present without talking about the past. We cannot talk about the reality of nowadays without understanding what uh, what colonialism did and the atrocities also that took place during, during those colonial times. And then I was ready to go a little bit further. And I heard of Australia. I heard of uh, a place that has been also heavily colonized, relatively, relatively more recently colonized, to the point that a lot of Aboriginal people, a lot of Indigenous people were still alive. Yeah. Somehow, somewhere, in some corner of the big island, yeah. still preserving their own indigenous ways that's what i heard so hearing this for me was like all i needed to where do you hear about like how did you documentaries talking to people other people that maybe i met in london that have been in australia okay um maybe different articles different things that i read it was like yeah I so watching I documentaries was like this first taste of i guess freedom for you and finding yourself because you said you watched a lot of documentaries even in milan about indigenous ways of life yeah definitely i mean it was my way of uh yeah, somehow, somehow it's one of them. One the of connection them. to the to the world outside of what you were living in. Yeah, yes. I mean, I would say that all of us, have, all of us, especially this type of generation, we, I mean, nowadays generation, they grew up with a smartphone. Yeah. Maybe as we grew up with television, and television, they show us what they want us to see, to watch, and um, that's as far as I could see, as far as they could allow me to see. But I knew there was much more, and therefore. I was like, yeah, let me go a little bit further. And then uh, once I arrived there, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything. No work, no jobs. My English still work in progress in Australia. Everybody was speaking in a way that I was like, yeah, bye-bye. Like all I was hearing was, wah, 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 I was like, oh, man, wah, wah, chill out. It was a bit too much for me, but I needed to eventually take my time in order to find my way around it. So I booked a hostel. I booked it for one week. Or even maybe it was even 10 days. I think no, it was one week. And I said... Within this week, I need to find a job. Mm -hmm. I arrived there with an airplane, as every airplane are, lands in an airport. Most of the airports are in a city, so back in the game, back in the city game. Yeah. I went there looking for nature, but I was in, in, in a city, but what to do? Let me start to integrate myself with whatever I know, yeah. and then from there I can see or find my way out. And so I started to look for jobs. I found a job as a waiter. Um, I was looking for anything, whatever was good. Also, I was looking for experience. Yeah. So I never worked in a restaurant. I was like, okay, let's do this. So I worked as a waiter. And then um, in the meantime, I stayed there for a little while. Then I actually moved somewhere in another city, 
somebody called me for another job actually still related to modeling so I went there and then I was like okay I want to go a little bit more further towards nature but I literally didn't feel the the courage to do so because in the end I felt it very I seen it very rom romantic in my head but how am I going to do this am I going to be able to do it am I going to be able to survive what do I know about it Mm. All of these documentaries, all of these dreams, all of these exchanges that I had, but all of these articles, all, all of these things that I've seen and read and studied, but what do I know about it? Yeah. I'm still a kid from Milan. <laughs> so, yes, it's in my blood. I'm from Ghana, I'm from India. But you never lived it. Yes, I never yeah. lived it. So just the thought of it was like literally stopping me. And then I was like, okay, in which way I can do it? Maybe I can find a middle way. In Australia, it's very popular, the farm work. So I was like, okay, I can go and work in a farm mm. outside of the city. And then take it from there, see maybe from there I might see a path and, and leave the farm and go into the bush. And so I apply any farm, a lot of farm, like on website. Yeah. And then this dairy farm actually replies, yeah, you can come. So I was like, never been a dairy farm. Let me go and see. And then never been in a far in a in a farm, in a dairy farm, in a in a farm altogether. So um, that was a, an eye-opening experience because uh I've seen for the first time the way conventional milk production was uh, was made like. Tell me more about what you saw. What do you mean by conventional milk production? So, um, first of all, the, I mean, the amount of cows. I mean, the amount of cows was a, was a, was, was a huge amount of, of cows around. Uh, to see them come in all early morning with um, almost like a, no, I wouldn't say a sad face, but we even like literally felt like a, like a almost like a funeral where all of them were just coming in the in the place where they were about to be milked i forgot mm -hmm. the name right now but it was like an automatic system where they were coming into this wheel and then as each cow comes they get attracted by the grain that they are going to eat it's almost grain. like a conveyor belt you know like when you get your baggage it's yes. like it's just yeah, that, or like that yeah but they get attracted by this grain that eventually has also some nutrients slash chemicals that even maybe possibly even make them addicted or whatever but anyhow mm. i'm not scientifically know about it but yeah. anyhow they're attracted by this grain they come in over they start eating and then our job was to put these literally tubes these suckers in their teeth on their teeth and uh, and then just they would just get milk as they eat they would just give milk one after the other one after the other one after the other and a lot of time you see a lot of teeth getting infected and then uh, you know this infection can spread because they use the same tool and then eventually you need to be careful not to use the same you know, sucker and yeah. the sucker or the very teeth needs to be signed so that you don't milk it so it doesn't affect other cows. And then you see a lot of uh, artificial impregna impregnation. How do you say impregnation, you say? Yeah, artificial mm -hmm. impregnation. Yeah. So, and then you see a lot of uh, artificial impregnation. Like the farmer goes all in with its arm and the cows all, once again, just there passively. For, to, to inject semen. Yeah, yeah, of course, to get them pregnant so they can start producing more milk and more milk and more milk. And then, um, then yeah, the overall situation, I, I didn't feel that environment was for me. I felt that um, I never had anything particularly against milk. I never had anything against the consumption of milk. But I clearly had an issue with the way uh, we were producing it. You know, it was, uh, yeah. was clearly that, that amount of milk was not to feed the human's needs whatsoever. Mm. was to feed something beyond our needs. was to feed our greed. was to feed our way of uh, nurturing ourselves that was completely disconnected from ourselves, completely disconnected from our actual needs. And so once again, I was still relatively young and didn't process all of that with this, let's say, uh, stream of thought, but I felt something was not for me. Yeah. So after a couple of weeks, I left and I was like, that's it, let me just go in Northern Territory. Northern Territory is an area of uh, Australia that is a relatively much more natural yeah like less as populated as well yeah much less populated and actually it's also quite interesting because the northern territory is one of those places where most of the aboriginal people has been pushed up uh, during colonization is uh, one of those areas that there was not much going on a lot of like uh, dang dangerous species as well over there mm -hmm. very tough environment and a lot of indigenous people have been pushed up to that environment that was not let's say so interesting for or oh, livable for that exactly. matter, yeah. And so um, once I arrived there, I once again ended up in a city looking for a job, found a job. I mean, the thing was not that hard anymore. I mean, it's just like a 
It's like a cycle of things. Yeah. And I realized that the problem about looking for a job is that you will find a job <laughs> and that you're stuck into the environment that most of the time doesn't really fulfill our heart. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, some people dare a little bit more to chase what they actually want to do. But I realized, especially from my upbringing in Italy, that by the way, I did a lot of work during summer or after school, yeah. that uh, we don't choose what we love. We don't choose our career. We just choose out of a menu. They give us this society, this mm. mainstream society gave us what we can do. Engineering, architect, uh, lawyer, doctor, journalist, whatever you, and you just choose the, yeah. whatever you choose. It's not what you wish to do deeply from the depth of your heart, of your heart, regardless what the environment around you says or what the environment around you tells you to. Basically, after I found a job, I was like, okay, let me not repeat that cycle. Let me start to challenge myself. And so in that environment was relatively wilder than anywhere else where I've been that far. Yeah. And um, so I was walking around and I've seen this beach. Next to this beach, there was a big cliff. It was about an hour away from the city, an hour walking from the city. And I got a, a tent and I was like, guess what? I'm just going to move here. I'm just going to stay here <laughs> and let's see what's going to happen. And so one night passed, another night, another night. And then I started to feel a sense of peace, a sense of belonging, a sense of oneness that I have never ever witnessed in my whole life. Like literally, I'm not joking. Now we, we kind of jump from one state of mind to another, but all of a sudden, the purity that the experience started to give me within and also on the, out, on the outer layer of myself was something that was really shocked to, to receive to the point that at times just in the morning waking up and see the ocean, hearing the birds, and see the sunshine and feeling that energy, that reality it literally brought me to tears and feeling tears of, wow, what I was missing. Wow, what I was uh, not allowing myself to live and to feel and to, and to become. And that very reality really gave me so much, incredibly so much, to the point that I remember, furthermore, one, one morning I woke up and I've seen from the distance, from the cliff, I've seen this uh, man going out there with a spear like about to fish. And it's something that me personally, I never witnessed in my life before. But uh, as I arrived there, uh, they was like, oh, are you guys here? What are you up to? Yeah, our brother is there fishing and we are preparing the fire. And once again, I never witnessed something to that degree. And so I went closer to see uh, the guy who was uh, spear fishing and it was low tide. So he was on like on above the, the sea and he was just overlooking. And then I seen him going boom. And then he, put up the spear and I've seen the fish. It's like, no way he caught the fish. Then all of a sudden I've seen something strange, which is him literally putting the fish back in the water. It's like, I don't know what's happened, but anyhow, he came back empty handed. Yeah. So I was like, oh, how come did you put the fish back? I seen you taking it. It's like, yes, uh, I was a fish that um, I took it from the side, first of all. And so it was not hurt. And uh, I noticed that uh, it was a baby and therefore it needs to keep on living. It's not its time now. Wow. And, uh, and then they also explained me that they also don't hunt neither fish, uh, mainly, I mean, hunt. they have also the knowledge to understand if a, 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 a species would be pregnant, a female, first of all, if it would be pregnant, if so, they don't even hunt it because that's what they're relying on. They're relying on the cycle of nature. Yeah. And this is exactly where I started to realize the difference between the experience that I had with the dairy farm, this reality of overproduction, of uh, not even connecting to what we extracting from, what and we are, who we get it from, who we get it from, in which way, why, what is the relationship with that? This man just literally is a, is not even is not even farming here. It was a random yeah. fish that just put back because it has the right to live, and also because it's it's just sense for me to be able to. So I'm relying on the life of the ocean. I'm relying on the cow as well. Therefore, we'll take care of it. Yeah. it's common sense. Yet nowadays we don't have this common sense anymore. We lost this connection completely to nature, to ourselves. And therefore, we have this reality that doesn't satisfy our needs, as I mentioned before. It only satisfies our greeds. I love how you describe that because the way you described the dairy farm that you were on versus experiencing this in nature. I've always had when, you know, when I say I'm vegan and I want um, a lot of people to be plant based, that purely comes from the industrialization and the commodification of animals in the industry it's the way it's produced not what and it's it's the how 
So, you know, whenever someone tells me, do you expect indigenous people to go vegan? That's not my concern at all. It's literally modern society, the industrialization of it, how we produce it, the scale, and the amount of exploitation and oppression that happens in the process. Exactly. That's, honestly, that's the problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Big time, big time. That's what I also started to come to realize while I was uh, on the beach on the very day. And uh, furthermore, one of the the elders, like there was uh, two people, no? Doing the, there was uh, one man, two men and one woman. And uh, one of the other men was like, come with me, come with me. He started to show me a lot of herbs, a lot of medicinal, like literally what for me was a bush was for him a pharmacy. And I was yeah. first time introduced to this beauty and wealthy, and at least I was walking past that that very uh, stream of, um, strip of, no, how do you call it? The very strip, yeah, the very strip of trees yeah. every day. But that day was when I started to realize the value of it, not only the ancestral value, but also the, the health value that he had. And uh, to be so beautifully and kindly introduced to all of that, to all of that knowledge, was so overwhelming and so motivating that actually allow me to say, hey, in this 21st century, is it possible? Yeah. We can live this way. Uh, there was just a, our days, last few days encounter that with the family that gave me so much that I learned from so much from. And eventually I also had other encounters that I had the privilege and the honor to gain so much motivation and inspiration from. And then, yeah, after that experience, uh, I felt somehow... There was still within me some willingness to make it within the Western world, let's say. And the way to make it for me was uh, going through the, the sport way. So I was uh, also very passionate about MMA, mixed martial art. And I started it actually when I was in Italy, in Italy right before I left. But I wanted to really learn from the best I could have learned it from. Yeah. And so I went into the States uh, in a place called Albuquerque, New Mexico. Also over there, I was super pumped by the experience that I had. So... I just went on top of a mountain. I remember I was uh, walking for 45 minutes, climbing for 15 minutes. So I was on top of a mountain and over there I put my tent. And it was so beautiful, so cold as well because that one is desert. So during the day, super hot. During the night, super cold. And then in order to go to the gym, I was walking for 15, I was climbing down for 15 minutes and walking for 45 minutes. And then going to the gym and spend the whole day there training like a, for like four to five hours a day trying to learn as much as possible about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, about wrestling, about boxing, about kickboxing, and much more. Then I had also my fight after three months of training, after two months of training, I, I was on a tourist visa, so I needed to kind of rush yeah. things a little bit. I had my fight, I won by TKO. I broke my nose though, but it was a, it was a very beautiful experience that also taught me a lot about- The broken the, nose? Yes, the, no, the whole experience. Yeah. It taught me a lot about the art of being in the moment. Because I actually broke that nose because I was not in the moment. After that experience, I was the was time for me to come to India. The most yeah. important thing for me is how has India shaped who you are and how, how has that shaped your journey and the person you are today? I felt the need to go very much outside of a Western context and I couldn't find a better place for my old for my younger self than India. And I went to Uttarakhand. I heard of this place known as the lands of the gods. It's like, wow, where yoga and meditation took place and was born. And it's like, wow, what's this? And I only heard about these things, but I wanted to learn from experience itself. Yeah. And so also the experience. It's what draws a lot of people to India in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, many, many people. Uh, I did read a book before coming here. It was called Siddhartha, hmm. which, uh, funny enough, I mean, was written by a, a German author, but was written so beautifully. And so nicely to the point that motivated me to come. So when I arrived here, uh, I came with uh, nothing else than a little backpack. Literally whatever I was wearing was all I had. I had a little backpack with inside um, literally like an empty book with a pen, the passport. I had a um, translatable would be 1.5 lakhs in a card, like one of those travel cards. Yeah. Just in case I didn't plan to use it, but I had it. I saved them from... Uh, Australia, because I still have some money that I saved. Mm. And then um, what else? And that's all. That's all I had with me. I had a blanket, a little blanket. So once I arrived there, it's a long story. But to make it short, I met some beautiful stranger that ended up becoming family, as I mentioned earlier. And then also I went to the the, the riverbank 
the holy Ganga, get to see the Ganga, get to meet the beautiful river that talks of, uh, of thousands of years of history, thousands of years of wisdom and, and, uh, and literally ancient knowledge that has been, st that is still alive, but somehow due to the wind coming from the West is becoming yeah. a little bit uh, more commercialized slash uh, forgotten within its true identity. Both commercialized and forgotten at the same time mm. when the meaning is being changed. Yeah. I know yoga and meditation drew you to India, mm. but so many times what I see is that what belongs to our culture and what is ours, we don't value that until it's taken by the West, repackaged and sold back to us as mm -hmm. something that we should aspire, Completely. aspire for, mm -hmm. right? Like for it to be percent. repackaged and sold back to us, that is what makes it attractive to us again, even though it's inherently ours, even though, you know, that's a piece of our culture. Exactly, exactly. And this, I think, is this is like due to the fact that a lot of people of color just wish to become, to be like white people. And then eventually we only value whatever white people would take from our culture, package it in their own way, and then we are just there like with a Mesmerized. open eyes, be yeah. like, oh yeah, give it to us. While actually has been already changed, like the meaning also of it, once they repackage it, it's already changed, it's already- It's lost. Completely lost. And that's also what I felt when I was in Rishikesh. Basically, uh, I then I went next to the mother, the, the mother Ganga, next to the river. And then I I just started to sleep on the on the beach, on the river. And uh, I remember like the first nights, like there was so much wind and the sand was becoming like bullet. So I couldn't really fall asleep there, but I still managed. And then in the morning bathing in the in the holy water was so refreshing, so beautifully. I felt so free, you know, even not to have any belongings, to have nothing, not even a tent, no a house, nothing. Just be there. It felt so free, free. completely free, yeah. so light, literally physically also light. And then at some point, because of the sand situation, I went a little bit more in depth, they call it the mango forest. Yeah. So I stayed there for like a, almost a month, sleeping in the forest, waking up with the jumps of the monkeys, with the sounds of the birds, with the sun rising and filtering through the trees. It was such a beautiful, harmonious reality that I managed to learn so much from, especially because I exchanged with a lot of what I later on came to know as babas and sadhus. And they taught me also with a lot of monks and yeah, they taught me so much about the art of meditation, yeah. the art of yoga. I also ended up after that period, I heard of uh, this group of uh, sadhus that were staying in, in caves. Yeah. Stay there, I met some sadhus. There. Also, I met some sadhus and babas where I heard of some sadhus and babas that were living in caves. So I started a journey looking for these caves. I didn't have like a Google Maps direction or whatever. They just told me, go straight. Then you see a bridge, you go left. Then you see this river, you cross it. Then you see this big rock. It was this type of direction. So I went, was in the end, just a whole day of walk. And I ended up, get into this cave after a little while. And then uh, I stay there for some days, just being in the reality and be surrounded by individuals that can see life so outside of conventionalism, so outside of, uh, of modernity as well, so outside of, uh, of attachment and see this dedication towards, like this dedication that goes also beyond their own self, you know, uh, trying to connect to something that goes also beyond what we conceive nowadays as as comfort, trying to go and touch uh, a part of God. You know, yeah. it was something so inspiring and so, so deep for me to experience that I never experienced ever before. And uh, India literally gave me a lot of it. You know, there's a, surely, eventually I discover with my general travels around India that it's surely a place that it cannot be romanticized. Every place has its own ups and downs. And I never seen a place, you mentioned me, a place on earth that has so many different people from so many different cultures, from so from so many different religious beliefs that still are managing to live together. Yeah. Then yeah, I so every state thing. is a country. Honestly, I feel like in this country, every state is a is a country in yeah, itself. Literally. That's what it is. And it literally is colonialism that all of a sudden put everybody together. And guess what? The British are did all those atrocities. We all know what Hitler did, but we don't talk about what Churchill did and literally killed millions of people in Bangladesh mm. or in, the, in Bengal. We yeah. don't even talk about it. Why? Because it was a, a white person that did it towards black, towards people of color. But when our white people involved, then all of a sudden it's a national or international holiday for everybody, but nobody talks about the atrocity that the British did here. And also within all of that... I've never thought about it that way. Never thought about it in a way that a white person oppressing white people 
that's become history mm-hmm. but we've somehow forgotten atrocities towards brown people Completely. i've never thought about it that way and also the fact that the british are literally they came they colonized they took resources they did whatever they needed to do and then they created also this amalgamation about this they created this all there was already some unification within uh, let's say india or barat as we want to call it like when the moguls were here they were was quite unified and whatever but also what the british did they also divide a lot of the place they unified and then they created this tension then pakistan bangladesh india and right now we live in a world where i seen a witness with my own eyes indians are more in love with britisher than they are with pakistani mm. knowing the history of what's happening here mm. it's like how i mean i'm not from here so i'm the last one that it's, can speak about it's colonialism that runs deep it's it's residual colonialism that still makes us want to be like them and follow their way of life and still puts them up on a pedestal knowing the history of this country completely and knowing the history of this country we know especially the wealth of this country their uh, gbd whatever it's called gb whatever they call it nowadays gdp uh, yeah that thing <laughs> oh, whatever name they use it for it just to define a wealth that is based on what gdp that they have all of this country has the highest gdp they are they also the countries have the highest level of depression the highest level of anxiety the highest level of pollution yeah but then they are very good in hiding all of their dirty business under the carpet then they come into the global south say hey you need to be careful how you pollute you guys you've been polluting ever since day one ever since the industrial revolution and right now you come into us telling us that we should stop polluting chill out yeah. just take care of your of your own uh, cows on the side of the world so again, and they've I mean, reached same with sustainability mm-hmm. right all these talks about sticking to 1.5 degrees celsius mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. global warming mm-hmm. and what we need to do the mm-hmm. onus is on developing countries mm-hmm. whereas these countries in the global north have had the privilege and the luxury mm-hmm. of polluting and reaching that living the the standard of living that mm-hmm. they needed to get to mm-hmm. and now they want to tell us that we can't aspire to that that we can't Completely. get there because oh now we need to care about global warming exactly so india gave me a lot and also what i learned was uh, from many of uh, i ended up also going to certain ashrams that, that were quite a rural areas and i've seen for the first time also in my life buildings made with natural resources a uh, building made with clay a uh, floor plastered with cow dung and getting explained by some of the yogis over there why mm. they use the uh, cow dung what is the beneficial for and uh, to understand that those principles and to see that those resources were actually available next to them without the need of polluting anything or oppressing anybody by a, a level of a cheap labor or modern slavery because who knows where these resources needed to be extracted from and who knows who is going to work on them mine own from which multinational yeah. no we just we have the ability to build naturally beautifully as well from our own land and that was the first time i was introduced to something like yeah. that it's so interesting that you say that because when i met you 5 days ago and you 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 came to mumbai and you saw these buildings around you mm. and the first thing i noticed was you were so you you were so disoriented mm. and you looked looked around and you said could it that way i don't look I, i don't look at buildings and go pollution yeah that's but the lens is so important the big especially i mean i was i was disoriented by the level i mean i was once again coming from a city accra which is the capital of ghana we will get there is also full of cement but the level of the sky the skyscraper the the amount of them the amount of of um, congested building one next to each other in order to to host who to do what to host people to do what to work to produce more to pollute more is is a cycle that keeps on going so that's gdp for you <laughs> that's what uh, yeah that's exactly that's, that's literally yeah, what it is yeah. and we should see at this state as something that is developed while in reality what does develop develops what our develops our disconnection from our inner nature our disconnection from our inner development after india uh then i ended up going to aotearoa nowadays known as new zealand and a beautiful land an amazing place also a whole story a whole adventure that led me to many different people many different uh, environments and uh, discoveries also of my own self i cycle with a bicycle all around the island for like a month and a half like thousands of kilometers it's been like a, such a empowering experience and also i was in samoa i ended up in the middle of the pacific ocean and samoa per se i want to quickly mention it because it's been really the experience that allowed me to say 
this life is not only possible, it's, it's doable. Like I've seen it and experienced it with my own eyes. I ended up in this island where 45 minutes you finish to walk around the island. There were no cars, no bikes, no even bicycle, only a path that was surrounding, like going around the island. So just walking. Just walking, only. yes. And uh, there were mainly four villages in this island. And I ended up in one village. There was, a, let's say, the literally a family that expanded and became one village. But I was also a little bit separated from this village. It was literally one family made out of 10 to 11 people. And uh, what I learned, what I gained, what I seen and did in, on that island was literally the, the climax of this uh, uh, natural quest. I realized, was, was, um, I solidified it by then. I know that this Western life, this way of producing, this way of consuming, this way of uh, oppressing is, is not something I want to feed. It's not something I want to feed myself from and also feed to. To see it is one thing, to comment on it, is one thing, but to actually do it, to leave all of your To leave life everything behind, yeah. And as to go life as we know it. A life like that, yeah, completely. You know? And that's what I realized. That's what I learned from the Babas, that there's a key ingredient that is needed in order to face this very much needed revolution that we need on nowadays Earth. And this key ingredient is detachment. There's no way we can go beyond this system without generating a level of detachment within Detachment ourselves. from what? Detachment from from how we used to perceive normality, number one. Do I need a house? Do I need this type of bed? Do I need light? Do I need energy? What do I need energy from? E electricity, why do I need it for? A laptop, a computer, a smartphone, what do I need it for? Number one, the detaching from the idea that this is needed. Number two, the detachment from what we are, what we think we are capable of doing, what we think in humans are or what they could be. And number three, most importantly, I believe, is detachment from uh, our dear ones from our friends and family, because it's a reality that uh, not everybody will be ready to walk the path of revolution, the path of change. And uh, you name me, a revolutionary, or even a spiritual leader, if we can say that way, that didn't perform a level of detachment. Nelson Mandela himself was known for being a very bad father because he needed, he chose his battle. You know, there's a level, we need to realize, you know, also within nowadays, we are into environmentalism. We know, how far we went within this society. Within, I think, six years, we will reach in 2030, maybe we reach already this 1.5 degrees yeah. that is going to change everything on Earth. We do not have time. We do not have time to play with the uh, with, uh, compromises. So, okay, let me, there's no small changes. There's no more change, small changes we can do anymore. We need to go radical. This has been always my motto. I realized via this experience of life that I needed to be radical. And nowadays, the term radical is often associated to something almost like negative. Yeah. But radical, the, like, I like to dissect words very often. I was going to so, ask, what does radical mean to you? Exactly. So literally radical comes from the Latin world. From the, sorry, literally radical comes from the Latin word that says radix. So radix is the word for that has been taken, eventually developed into English word, into radical. The word radix literally, literally means root. So... Oh. Being radical means going back to the roots, going to the roots cause of the problem. If we have a society that has issues, the issue is not on its fruits. Yeah. The issues must be on its roots. But also going back to our roots is and what we've been talking about. And also completely going back time. to the roots, completely metaphorically and physically. Yeah. And uh, I, I really appreciate, I felt very honored and really also privileged to have had the chance to learn from many rural and indigenous communities around the world because I've seen that they knew the way. I don't want to romanticize the ancient way. Of course, there was also a lot of issues within indigenous communities. Wars has always been around. Yet we also can historically track down to society and communities that they understood it. They really yeah. practiced it. They really managed to create an egalitarian society that allowed themselves to be connected to, to themselves, to, to, to whatever was around them, to nature. There's not even a concept of nature. What is this nature thing? Let me go mm. for a hike. What is this? I'm not going, I'm not going, oh, let me go. I love nature. Oh, I don't like nature. We can, we are nature. There's nothing that we can like or dislike about it. We are that. But we are so delusional that we think that we are completely disconnected from it. And I can see the same uh, thought process within our education system. We are, we, we dissect everything. We have different um, subjects, you know, math, science, ge uh, geography, uh, history. There's no way we can dissect things there's no way even when we absorb when we observe a subatomical particle we realize that observer will influence the 
behavior of that very particle yeah. because we all united Ph- physiologically speaking i am alive because of the oxygen mm. i'm alive because of water i'm alive because of the sun yeah it's not like i'm i'm not tripping with that i said it already before in other podcasts whatever we are nature 100% is a oneness that we are involved with and many indigenous community out of survival you need to understand that otherwise you're out of the way yeah but and it's re- the arrogance that we need to save nature it's we're saving the planet which is honestly the other way around i went to different places i went to the rocky mountains to check i went to patagonia to check i went to the alps to the apennines and i realized that there was not that environment that allowed me to have that level of freedom where i could also not only survive but also thrive a place like patagonia is a place where you thrive like the indigenous people over there this, like in winters are rough indigenous people were surviving by going in the ocean with canoes catching whales with their own hands and a whale that could feed them for a whole year or for a whole winter i didn't have that knowledge you know so how can i do that and so i went back, while i was in italy doing uh, the excursion on the alps i went to my father's place i went to eat in his place then i shared with him the adventure of the last year of me going all around the world looking for this piece of land because that's what i needed to do yeah and um and then yeah he told me very casually he was like oh but do you know that we have lands in ghana <laughs> like okay <laughs> oh, like i went around the world to find uh, a piece uh, of land and he was sitting chill. on it so no, i was very casual very chill have you read the alchemist yes yes yeah? yes very beautiful book very beautiful book it just reminds me of that it's a so journey ways, yeah. yeah it's a journey indeed and that's, it's a hero's journey as well you you go through challenges and you find yourself and mm-hmm. then somehow you know it's it's a full circle and then that hero wins completely i like this analogy that you're making with the alchemist because um also what's happened to to the guys that he goes through his own path if i in order to go through his own path he goes through a lot of challenges yeah. and i believe that this journey that led me to ghana was part of that journey because then we arrive in ghana once i'm in ghana uh with my uncle i went around looking for these lands that were kind of lost by my great grandparents basically this land were left in heritage by my great grandparents mm. and um they got this land in the 20th century and eventually they left it for the upcoming generation but everybody because of westernization modern times who goes to the city who goes abroad and this land are just left over there and so once i went back there the elders of my family my uncle my father's older bro- eldest brother was very glad that i was there so that somebody would have done something with, with what has been left from our forefathers you know that they put so much effort in order to for mothers as well that they put so much effort in order to leave such wealth and also allow me to understand how wealth was perceived in uh, in those days that was the land the, the land is wealth that's where our food comes from our medicine is coming from there that's what we need our water so of course we need land but nowadays we are so detached that we don't even know where the food is coming from going back to what you were talking about even meat industry we don't even know there was something that was alive yeah it's just something that is packed over there we open it we don't know the history of it and that's i think is the issue is that we are disconnected from our nature in the first place it's sold as a story it's completely. sold very differently to what it really is completely so we believe that the earth was born on a on a thursday when the planets were aligned where we see that would be considered thursday and uh, we see her as a we call it yeah with a feminine connotation because we see her with all the feminine entity of a of a mother mother nature indeed because uh earth indeed is very it gives a lot of nurturance it takes care it provides and these are very feminine characteristic that's why we call her mother earth or we call it asasia and the every thursday for every farmer around my area doesn't matter what is asasia day so is earth day so it's every, a day that oh, no, day every thursday every thursday yes yeah, a day that nobody goes to farm the land the earth asasia needs to rest so we don't need a earth day once a year it's just something that is embedded within our 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 weekly basis mm. when we also remind on the daily basis that we rely on the earth because that's where our food is also coming from yeah. there's also most of the the work that I'm doing Ghana about uh reforestation about uh, food foresting and about medicinal forests as well so it's about relying and directly see and feel and understand this this um uh, this relationship this nurturance relationship that comes from earth and the the way this modern world treats earth is the same way this modern world patriarchal world treats also women you know we what's the connection the connection is a uh, i mean the way we see everything see the how we talked about initially colonization 
is connected, is all about extraction. The colonization was about looking for land, looking for resources, extracting, extraction, exploitation. So we translate also the same way towards uh, our woman and in a way that we don't, uh, we don't value them anymore. We don't, uh, we don't create, even more, we don't create a space. It's a society that is so aggressive, mm. it's so fast, that doesn't leave space for somebody that also needs to take its time. A woman sometimes has her period. What to do during the period? Generally, it's a time where it needs to be indoor, needs to take it easy, needs to be chill. But we live in a society, hey, where we need to produce. So let's go. Let's go and, and create more production, more production. Yeah. And then we have this also feminine movement that is all about being equal. In the meantime, biologically speaking, like I don't have a period personally. You might have a period. And this already creates a difference. We are not equal already on a biological level. Yeah. No? So to me, it's not asking this patriarchal society to make space for a woman to be able to to work or to have the same fa pace of a man within this sick environment. But it's a, matter, it's a matter of creating, changing a society that allows a woman to be arrested and to still be valued and be able to give and to receive from society. What I'm getting from it is regeneration, which is you allow the Earth Overshoot Day, if you've heard about it, it's uh, the day that we use up all of the Earth's resources that for that particular year it's been pushed earlier for the last couple of years if you know say earth overshoot day happened in august and now happens in july uh which means by july we actually end up using all of earth's resources for that entire year mm -hmm. it's about just replenishing letting the earth recover mm -hmm. and reproduce and regenerate those resources so we have enough and we're not living in timeline with that definitely definitely as well completely sam It's, it's a society that is based on this greed. Like also Mahatma Gandhi, for some could be controversial, but he did a lot of things. He said a lot of beautiful things as well. One of the things he used to say is that Earth is definitely enough for humans' need, yeah. but not for humans' greed. Mm. And nowadays we... women and also their natural biological way don't find too much space within this crazy society. Yeah. Um, living in a self-built eco-village in Ghana, it's easier for you to be self-sustainable. It's easier for you to live and work with nature, hands-on as well. But what can someone living in a city do? What can someone living in this concrete jungle? Is there anything an individual or what is the most impactful thing an individual living in a city do without moving to, say, a forest? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, um, I mean, you I You think was, the answer is moving to a forest? I was in a city. I was in the environment. I was in an environment. I made the... It was not easy for me to do this, to go towards that journey. Mm. It's a whole journey. It didn't take like a... It's not a journey that went from A to B or A to Z. It was a whole journey of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all of that. Yeah. And eventually I managed to find not only the land, but also the maybe beyond the land is the knowledge and the courage and, the, and the also the audacity to do so. And um, so I believe that nowadays, I mean, we need to then rely, we need to understand and really analyze what somebody in the city would do. Like, for example, let's say we are in the United States of America. And nowadays a lot of people are starting to realize the atrocity and the craziness that is going on in Palestine, yeah. how many people are getting killed on a daily basis. Mm. And these people are getting killed because of a complete colonialist mentality that is taking place from a government that completely lost its roots from humanity. There's also a lot of Jewish people that are not claiming their, those atrocities whatsoever. This is not about religion whatsoever. This is about land. Yeah. It's about people that wants to colonize and taking over land. And we've seen this because By now, it's not even about, uh, it's, 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 they keep on killing in order to get rid of people, in order to take over spaces. So we are in the United States of America. Somebody realizes that. And this person also comes to the realization that all those bombs that are dropped 
are coming from the literally from their own tax money. Taxpayers' money. Yeah. Completely from their own tax. They pay taxes just by buying a cup of tea, paying their own taxes. Some money will go in order to kill innocent people on the other side of the world. Mm. So what should I what that person should do? To me, is literally is a system that needs to be replaced. And a sick system cannot be fixed. It can only be replaced. This was uh, as Mandela said. An apartheid system cannot, like in South Africa, it's not it's not about you know, let's try to find a way within this craziness. Yeah. It's like we need to keep it real right now. Once again, within a few years, we are not even going to be able, maybe even to have water is going to be a, lux a luxury, literally in a few years, water. Yeah. Maybe soon also oxygen. We are here talking because we don't, we, maybe we didn't feel it that much yet. But soon, especially India, special place like India, everything will be flooded. And then what are we going to be doing? Where are we going to be? Where are our money are going to be? We're already there. Heat Where? every summer is unbearable. You see, it's got to come more and more. Coming back to radical, being radical, and coming back to going to our roots, as you said. But not everybody will have the way out, of course, because yeah. we are so used to this way of living. And then, can everybody go from this big city back to nature? We need to, of course, implement certain also regulation on a governmental level. But that one is not up yeah. to us. What I'm saying is that. What can we do? I, I don't mean, have the answer because I know we're driving our own destruction. I don't have the answer because I know we're not moving fast enough. That's the thing. But I also, I don't want to see this pessi like I don't want to see. I don't. I'm not pessimist. I'm not optimist. I'm realistic. And realistically speaking, we can make the change. It's all up to us. It's literally about the way we decide to consume. Is it, we need to change as as Tupac Shakur used to say, we need to change the way we live, let's change the way we eat, let's change the way we treat each other, let's, let's change the way we care for each other, but from the depth of our, the core of our heart. And in order to do so, we really need to change everything about ourselves. And, and it's a journey. It's a journey that takes, you know, time. We don't have too much time. Then let's start to walk the talk. Let's start to do that. You know, maybe let's start by a, planting some trees in our or some plants. Let's start by having some, I don't know, some little garden in your house or in your balcony. Welcome uh, to my little forest. This little forest right here. Uh, growing uh, some, creating some uh, reforestation within cities. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, once again, the land, there's still a lot of, very a lot of land around the world. And I believe that my work is about creating models like sustainable models, indigenous inspired sustainable models from where many other rural areas can get inspiration from, from where people can be like, okay, we can relocate in these environments. Each acre can host like literally quite of a good amount of people. And then we can recreate these villages where people would be first, first, first of all, re-educated about a natural way of living and eventually partaking within this way of life and start to become the change that they all want to see, yeah. you know? But I believe a relocation is, is needed. A relocation relocation of the closer mind. to nature. Completely, a relocation of the mind, the consequential would be a, uh, a relocation of the body. Uh, I don't think there's a, yeah. there's another solution around, especially nowadays. We need to be radical. Yeah. We need to go back to the roots. Is modernism westernized? Is us trying to be modern, trying to mm. emulate Eurocentric mm. American way of living, a mm. white way of living? And what you said before, you see a lot of brown people trying to mimic white people's way of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've... I've seen that, right? And mm -hmm. I've, um, I think I, on some level, I'm also part of that because mm -hmm. you want to travel abroad and you want to look a certain way and you want to dress a certain way. And mm -hmm. so much of what we think of beauty is also Euro Eurocentric mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. of defining beauty. Yes. And not just that, not just like way of living, but I also want to touch upon something that I experienced with you the other day, which is you went to the gym for the first time in five years. Mm -hmm. And this thing about machines mm -hmm. that, being the modern way of life application, chat GPT, AI, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but machines in particular, mm -hmm. you, you're still well built. And I, mm -hmm. I told you that the fact that you look fit and you are fit, mm -hmm. but without going to a gym. And you told me that that's because you work with the soil really, yeah. and cooking your food. You don't, you don't use machine. You don't use blenders. I've seen your videos and it's, it's mm -hmm. all with hand. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It's a beautiful point that you make in here because um, often we see this um, development as a, an outside development. Uh, but rather I believe that nowadays, especially more than ever, we need to redirect our development more within an inner development. And the way life works and also evolution worked in a way that uh, things are, I need to be physical. You know, like some of the healthier 
and long like people that also live the longest if we can say also that way in the world are actually uh, in certain places also in japan no there's an island over there the way they eat for sure but also all of them are having one things in common they never stop to be physically active and they all have a little garden that keep them also active yeah. and that's how our wor body works you know more sedentary will become and more also we will be prone to have different strange type of diseases and but we need to be physically active and this very physicality will also develop our immune system will develop our very strength will develop our connection to what we're doing also the very action of uh, putting uh, some food into the grinder the machine grinder yeah versus pounding it literally there's scientific proof that shows that the nutritional values of those that have been pounded versus the one that have been grinded are much higher just because it's, it's just the way it works you know they are less shocked they are less like a uh, treated in a in a very artificial uh, way artificial way indeed it's also machine when it comes to gym i mean once again i'm not against um, any level of development it's just or out, outer development it's just understanding what is it about do we actually need it you know because right now a lot of yeah machine we have there we have a chat gbt that apparently you know with uh, every request you get a 15 liters no, a whole bottle of water of every request is equal to one bottle of water exactly and 15 minutes of light yeah like of light as well so it's like a it's like okay we have all this technology that is growing we have also the, this green revolution in terms of like technological not to mention chat gpt is inherently biased especially with what's happening in israel right now we're going to check it out yourself guys and then and, and tell us yeah. and uh, but especially like uh, as also is um, we have all this technology machinery at the gym cars electric cars solar panel all of that my, my question is very simple i'm not against it my question yeah. is how it is produced this is same arg uh, argument and conversation we had about the food yeah. so how it is produced and then you see that behind this green technology or behind this green technological revolution there is a huge level of climate in, insane climate pollution but furthermore human oppression mm -hmm. literally modern slavery as we speak now right now we use the tools here in order to deliver the message the microphone the cameras our phones everything but, but we need to keep it real all of these resources most of these resources are coming from mines from where children are actually working now as we're speaking mm. like colton used in every uh, phone laptop we have a uh, cobalt used for creating engine and um, even like a um, certain uh, high speed uh, uh, like eolic uh, energy as well and so on we have also uh, copper used in order to you know create electricity all over and all of these resources are where are they coming from they're coming from certain places mainly they coming from the Congo and Africa is one of the biggest place on earth there's most resources that all the westerners are in need of for their own multinationals why is Africa so important from a global point of view because most of the resources are there once again this green revolution if Congo decided to stop this production that's all it's finished like mm -hmm. are you aware have you ever heard of the Manhattan project have you heard I think Maybe so you're... Manhattan project was the project that took place in New York where Half a, where half a million of people were involved to build the atomic bomb without even knowing that. Do you know that two thirds of the we're talking about of the uranium? The, uh, do you know that two thirds of the uranium used to create the bomb that dropped on Hiroshima was coming from the Congo? Two thirds, and this half a million people built the bomb they didn't even know. Two thirds of that very uranium needed to build a nuclear power. came from the Congo. Wow. And Oof. child 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 labor killed ch children in uh, in Japan. You know like That's make, make it make sense like, like let's think it for a little bit like child labor killed somehow innocent kids and children in Japan. And he's like I can't wrap my head around. It. What type Just... of system are we feeding? And that's the point, you know. So all this technology is good but also Albert Einstein, Uncle Einstein used to say, humans humans are smart enough to create the atomic bomb, but no mouse has ever created a mouse trap. And this is literally uh. like what we are doing. It's like we are using all of this smartness whatever, you know, to just go against each other. Self destruct. Exactly. Also also with the within the the health industry, no? Mm. Which is very you know, okay, we are living longer nowadays. We have a lot of disease that we can get rid of more easily but also we have a lot of other diseases that are 
like taking over very strangely that we all of a sudden cannot even cure. You have crazy cancer coming from every corner. Mm-hmm. Even people relatively living, living healthy, they're having cancer as well. And uh, so it's like, and then we're living longer also, relatively longer than in ancient times. We used time. to, yeah. In the meantime, living longer in order to do what? We live longer in order to pollute more, to have more people on earth that pollutes even further more, that oppress even further more. So it's like all of this development is to do what? And it feels like there is really about this unawareness of the fact that we are nature. We are, mm. we will die. We will suffer. We will, jo- we will enjoy. We will, be, we will be giving birth. We are separated from this cycle of, of reality. You know, we are disconnected. And so I believe that it's very important, very crucial for each, every one of us to reconnect somehow to nature. If you are in the city, I'm not saying there's no chance, but I'm saying try your best to maybe invest some of this money in a piece of land, yeah. preserve the land. So maybe no multi, multinational will go there and spoil it. Do some little project over there because ine- inevitably you will spend those money. And there's also a lot of talks about all oh, these things are super costly. Yeah. Uh, sustainable living, or oh, you need to get the land here and there. To me, I mean, it was an experience, but it was not necessarily too many, too much money involved. Also, I built my own home uh, under one lakh uh, because I use mainly local resources. About also a level of prioritization, like or a level of prioritizing. Like we do pay rent, we do pay. How much money are going away for that? That like music uh, platform for that movie platform for makeup every day for clothing, shoes. People having thousands, like literally hundreds of shoes. Um, everything that we might wear, everything that we might, my gym membership, all of this is all costly, no? And by the end of the year, if you do a calculation, the end of after three years, four years, we do a calculation, how many lakhs yeah. are spent for these type of things? Yeah. So in the end, it's like, let's try to prioritize then. Let's prioritize, maybe let's invest because nature is an investment. Yeah. Let's try to take some of this money aside. Let's spend less on superficialism. Let's try to save more for whatever we might actually need and our society will also be in need our upcoming generation will be in need of let's invest in the land and one thing about land investment is that is the best investment you could ever do period you plant one seed will become one tree it will give hundreds of thousands of fruits hundreds of thousands of seeds yeah, it's a gift that keeps giving they will give food and nutrition and who knows how many you know cosmetics and products to so many people for so many years so there's no better investment than investing in the land. Mm. And so that's what I'm trying to, to push also with, uh, to, to share also with my social media pages, understanding the, the vital investment that we need to do on the land, especially because also monetarily, if you want, also talking the way, because soon land will be incredibly, incredibly valuable, like food, water, and oxygen will be incredibly valuable. Yeah. And you make it look sexy. And if you do it on social media, I know you make it look sexy. And there are a lot of thirst traps there as well. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> no, 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 there's no thirst traps. It's, it's, it's not, true. No, it's no, true. No. Thirst I mean, it is a true. sexy reality. That's why it's a banger. Every time I say it's another banger. Yeah. Another banger is coming actually from a, a singer. Every time he drops it in his Afrobeat, he's like such a talented <laughs> singer. And actually, I translated it into somewhere where you feel it like it's just food or it's just food uh, like farming or it's just like a natural building but it's banging you know what i mean it's it like is a, banging, it's, it's sexy it's nice it's juicy it's a mango hey mango did you try it? like a sweet mango juicy a hot summer. ripe that one is juicy like hmm <laughs> too juicy i'm telling you that's what the, the soul is in need of you know but uh, nowadays we prefer going i don't know somewhere and having uh, i don't know some nonsense things in a uh, popcorn at the cinema Meg, just look at like, just sit down under the shade of, during a hot day, go under the shade of a mango and just take that sweetness out of the tree and enjoy it. You see how much nature loves you. You feel the love within your heart and all the questions in your life will be answered. Wow. (laughs) This is what I mean by making it sexy. Yeah. I mean, it is sexy. Joshua, what does sustainability mean to you? Um, Nice question. Sustainability very, it's, it's simple. Sustainability means simplicity. I believe that my motto is uh, simplicity is the key to prosperity. And uh, we cannot be sustainable if we don't realign with our actually need. We, are, if we cannot be sustainable if we don't realign with our real needs. As Mahatma Gandhi used to say, to say within Indian context, the world earth has enough resources for humans need, but not for humans greed. And so it's like a, not really like sustainability is about really realign with our needs and be simple. And there's no, because if we start to be simple 
we start to really give satisfaction to what we actually need. And more simple we are, and that's what I notice all around the world, more simple communities are, and more they have to give, more they have to share, more joy there is, more alignment there is. So that's my definition of sustainability. That's beautiful. Reality that we need to acknowledge in order to understand that society act in certain way that gives privilege to certain people and it disadvantages to others. And yes, we all love and light. We are all the same. We are all equal in front of life, in front of a call it God, call it the mighty one. We are all the same. In the meantime, it's a fact that society doesn't treat us equally. And therefore, if you are not aware of this, then we cannot really find the steps in order to find social liberation. Because in the end, for me, this, this movement is not about simply the environment. It's a social movement. It's a revolution. And in order to do this revolution, we need people. And in order to do that, we need to understand how people are treated. What are the positions? What are the spaces of these people? For us to understand which tool we need to have and what we need to take back in order to fight our fight. Then eventually we'll bring into unification. You know, there's no race. There's no nothing of that. And eventually we need to realize that we all won. But we need to understand that we all birds with different colors. And because of these different colors, certain, certain birds have been treated differently. Last question, what gives you hope? I think just being alive. I think that uh, we live life and sometimes we take it for granted, you know, like really, there are really, really little chances for us to being able to experience life on earth. There are very little chances for us to being able to be on this earth, like as like with consciousness, you know, and to be able to to live, to walk, to understand, to feel. So the fact that we are alive, it is a gift just by default. And every morning we should wake up acknowledging the fact that it's another day, it's another blessing, it's another gift. Every day is a new birthday. The fact that from yesterday we had today doesn't mean that from today we will have tomorrow. Every day is a gift. So that's the hope per se. I'm still alive. What shall I do? What is, what is the best thing I can do? And that's why live if it's going to be your last day, but learn as if you're going to live forever. So, yeah, that's what gives me hope. And the, the gifts that nature gives us and the knowing gifts, that nature exactly. is, a, is a gift that keeps on giving and it's an investment that keeps on giving exactly. as well in great returns. Joshua, for all the gifts that you've given us tonight, I wanted to give you a gift in return. Something that is literally made of earth. That's what it's called. May made of earth I see. that's for you cool. thank you for me. and that's from a yeah. friend of mine ron and jen who's made these beautiful cups that we've been drinking out of this mm -hmm. one's actually made out of bamboo fiber that's yeah. made out of rice husk this is made out of coffee grounds and coffee essentially grounds. the mission of the company was to give a second life to crop waste Okay. So they're bio-based, they're biodegradable, and every product actually saves 75 to 150 grams of um, the crop waste from going into landfill, which would have eventually um, been burnt. Okay. So that's that's made of earth. Oh, that's great. That's for great. Oh, for our nature boy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here, Joshua. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate your award so much. And everything that you've that everything that I learned from you every time I meet you. And your energy is infectious, appreciate, really. Appreciate. No matter what you thought of me the first time you <laughs> met me, I hope that's changed over time. But I am very grateful for you and I truly appreciate our friendship. Likewise, I appreciate also the time that we spent here. It's been an honor. Yeah. Appreciate it. Did you know the first time we met in Auroville, every mm. single one of us had a crush on you? Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> no. We're all like, who? No, <laughs> That is going on. That is going just to embarrass you. Just okay, to embarrass you. Yeah, yeah, like I'm not aware of that. It is about this. We are talking. No, it's not like a, a TV show. Like it a is a TV of, show. We have to keep it spicy. Oh no, no, leave the spice away. Like the colonizer already took enough. What's your take on monogamy, commitment, <laughs> relationship, labels, Joshua? Right. No, it, it, do you get this? Do you get this attention? <laughs> <laughs> My camera is still rolling. Okay. Do you get attention all the time? Do I get what? Do you get attention all the time? Attention. Are you used to getting attention? Mm. <laughs> no comment my only attention that my, i mean real real talk i met one in my life i really been deeply in love deeply 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 in love once that's it one time one time the pure the pure okay. pure pure in love once because also i think nowadays many people are having their own interpretation of what love is mm. in reality also what can be a word made out of four letters be able to describe all the feelings that somebody can feel for somebody else but the, the deepest love I felt was with Asasiya. 
Thank you very much. My God, huh? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give you a hug. Thank you. Oh, Come appreciate here. it. Thank you very much. I got to get this straight. <laughs> Please cut this. <laughs> You have some story to tell us. My little... Welcome to my podcast, by the way. So, What's what is the, what is the, my um, sitting with Shia? Yerate abnai darakti. Um, I hope that you're gonna cut all this <laughs> shit out of this thing, eh? Otherwise, uh, I'll call my lawyer. But anyhow, you call uh, your lawyer. Which lawyer? With what, eighty thousand rupees? <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. Okay, money. Sorry about that. Sorry if we don't have the same amount that you got. I'm tere bin lavere na isak. Look at you. Look uh -huh. at you. You're like, <laughs> like mm, oh. so happy. Oh. Oh. You're so cute. You're Look so at you. cute. Oh. <laughs> I hope we're recording all of this. You like the. Oh, look at, look at him. <laughs> you and celibacy. Mm. That is the question. Okay. Uh, mind your business. What's your celibacy? <laughs> How long have you been with it? What the f? <laughs> Yerate abnai darakti dimbi sanse nehi lete ab to ha jao mere sone a. I was not in tune though. The microphone will hear that. <laughs> I mean, you're welcome though. You're welcome. No, thanks. You thanks are welcome the same way you always welcome at your place. You'll come over wow. and then I will leave and then good luck. You'll just leave me alone in the <laughs> good luck. to figure it out. Yes, yes, yes. But well, you manage. I left you with Jitu. I left you with house stuff. I left you with food. I left you with. I don't know. How, what what else did you need? I will leave you Nothing. with a whole land full I of trees. I left you with vegan gelato, Joshua. Ooh, the gelato was nice. See, I don't I don't leave you in a forest. Did I do that? No. But see, that's the point. See, the point of the whole conversation is the fact that you see more value in a vegan gelato than in a forest. No, that's I how don't. much disconnected we are. <laughs> Keep it in mind, everybody. There's a second. We can finish up here the conversation. Take him back. Take there's. Him back. <laughs> So that's the point. So that's exactly what I'm trying to change within people. The conception of life. So when people start to realize... Joshua. I know I'm still finishing. I think I need that forest way more than I need vegan gelato. Definitely. I would agree. I would agree on that. And we can also make next level gelato, by the way, in the in the very rural settings. I would love that. Next level. There's that juicy, sweet mango and... Sweetness. The way all day, you every describe day. it. Yeah, I'll be making a sexy video about right. making that gelato. Right. Girl, right. So chill out, guys. <laughs> I truly hope that you're going to edit all of this nonsense out of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like so weird. <laughs>